All right, I guess it's about uh, two minutes after six and I can go ahead and get started. Um, uh, welcome to the, the new year of Grand Rounds. I'm uh, really happy to be here tonight um, talking to you a bit about um, some of my research in managing dis, uh, measuring dysphagia in patients with head and neck cancer. Um, for those of you who I don't know, my name is Heather Starmer. I am a clinical associate professor in the department and the director of the Head and Neck Speech and Swallowing Rehab Program in the Cancer Center. Um, so tonight I'm going to be sharing with you sort of the state of the science on uh, measuring dysphagia in patients with head and neck cancer. Uh, in terms of disclosures, um, I do have grant funding from the American Speech and Hearing Foundation a Clinician Researcher Grant that uh, funded the work that I'll talk about in terms of a digest fee scale. Um, and I won't be talking about the head and neck cancer virtual coach tonight, um, but I do have a SBIR NCI grant for that project as well. So to start off, we want to think about what exactly is dysphagia and how should we be measuring this? Um, when we think about dysphagia as, as a broad concept, it really refers to any difficulty or discomfort in swallowing. And so it may be something that is a patient perceived issue, or it may be something that's an actual neuromotor issue. Um, and so depending upon how we're defining dysphagia, we may need to use different tools in order to measure dysphagia. Uh, we can also think about some of the consequences of dysphagia, such as um, choice of nutritional intake, um, thinking about health-related consequences like aspiration, pneumonia, malnutrition, dehydration. And certainly we can see quite a significant impact on participation in patients with dysphagia who are used to being able to go out and enjoy meals and social gatherings that revolve around eating and drinking. Um, so we really wanna think about dysphagia as this sort of multifaceted construct that we need to think very carefully about how we're going to be measuring. And so a number of studies over the past few years have really been trying to determine, are there particular tools that are better for measuring dysphagia in head neck cancer patients? And this is a study from some of our colleagues in the UK and Australia, where they looked across 123 different patients um, who had, had, had been treated for head neck cancer. And they looked at a number of different tools that are commonly used clinically. Um, one of them being the penetration aspiration scale, which measures depth of penetration into the airway in response to that material. They looked at a water swallow test, which is a commonly used screening tool for dysphagia. They looked at a normalcy of diet scale, which is part of the performance status scale of head and neck, as well as a patient reported outcome tool called the MD Anderson dysphagia inventory. And what they found was that there was a fairly high correlation between diet level and patient reported outcomes, suggesting that those individuals who have more advanced diets are generally more um, happy with their swallowing outcome. Um, in contrast, though, they did find that there was fairly poor correlation between penetration aspiration scale scores and patient reported outcomes, suggesting that these two issues are probably quite different constructs and that airway infiltration is not necessarily the primary driver of patient perception of swallowing. Similar findings uh, were found by a group um, in Cleveland looking at uh, functional oral intake score, so a different diet scale, as well as a different patient reported outcome tool, the E10. Again, they found poor correlation between the physiologic measures of swallowing and the patient reported outcomes. Uh, so again, this supports this notion that physiologic findings are not necessarily going to be the primary drivers of patient perception. And that's really important for us to think about when we're designing studies investigating swallowing in this population. But we also can't ignore the physiologic findings because they do lead to consequences that are quite important from a health status perspective. And so we really need to be thinking about, are there a core set of measures that are particularly useful in measuring dysphagia in this population? So as I mentioned earlier, dysphagia is really a multifaceted construct and really it requires a multifaceted or multidimensional evaluation. Um, it's not enough to just do one type of measure because we know that they don't necessarily correlate very well and we need to pick up on all these different subtleties of dysphagia. So we might think about symptom indexes or quality of life scales. Uh, we might think about things like diet level or alternative nutrition as a surrogate for swallowing. 
We might want to look at health consequences such as pneumonia, nutrition issues. Um, we might want to very specifically look at the neuromotor function. And we also may look at some complementary clinician rating scales. And I think it's really important that we think about what is the intention of our assessment when we're thinking about these different sorts of tools. So what we might need clinically may be very different than what we might choose from a research perspective. So for example, if we were trying to do a study to look at whether transoral robotic surgery or radiation caused more swallowing issues, we may really want to look at actual physiologic function rather than just patient reported outcomes. Um, so again, it's just very important for us to be thinking about the intention of our assessment when we're choosing the tools or the core set of tools we want to use. There are a number of different validated tools that can be used to capture the patient's perception, both in terms of symptoms and the impact of those symptoms on quality of life. The MD Anderson dysphagia inventory is probably the most widely used patient reported outcome tool in the head and neck cancer population. Although the EAT-10 and the Sydney Swallow questionnaire are also both uh, very high quality validated tools that have been used in this population. Uh, there's also a tool that's specifically designed for patients who've had a total laryngectomy called the Swallowing Outcomes After Laryngectomy. So that's another good tool that we can use in that specific population. We can also think about diet level, and it's important that we go beyond just saying if somebody has a tube or doesn't have a tube, we really want to think about how, how what they're able to consume. So the functional oral intake score is a really nice scale that is gives us basically seven points where we can quantify the types of food that people are, are eating as well as whether or not they have a feeding tube. So a score of one means they're fully feeding tube dependent. A score of two means that they have a feeding tube, but they take a little bit of PO intake up to a score of seven where it's indicating totally normal diet. Uh, the PSS head and neck provides slightly different information from a diet perspective. It doesn't contain that information about feeding tube use. So I think that they can be very complementary to one another but it does provide a little bit more granular data about the types of food specifically. So can they tolerate meats? Can they tolerate raw vegetables? Um, so both of these um, can be used together to really get a nice complementary look at diet outcomes. Now, instrumental swallowing assessment is a really critical part of the toolbox in patients with head and neck cancer because we know that a clinical swallowing evaluation is really inadequate in this population. Uh, patients who've had head and neck cancer tend to have sensory impairment, and the clinical evaluation is not sensitive or specific enough in order for us to get really good information. Um, aspiration in particular is uh, very poorly correlated with patient-reported outcome tools and clinical swallowing evaluation. So an instrumental evaluation is quite critical. It allows us to evaluate both the safety and the efficiency of the individual swallow, it allows us to define the physiologic parameters of the swallow, to determine if there are strategies, postures that we might need to use to make their swallow more safe or efficient. Certainly we use this for treatment planning and not just from behavioral perspective, but in determining, is this patient better suited by a surgical approach, a dilation for example, or is this person somebody who is more likely to benefit um, from swallowing therapy? And so the modified barium swallow uh, for many years was considered the gold standard. Um, now we, we say that there's sort of two gold standards, but um, it's definitely an invaluable tool for the head and neck cancer uh, swallowing specialist uh, because it allows us to visualize the entire swallowing process basically from lips to stomach. Um, these are uh, very commonly used both in terms of research as well as in terms of clinical, but the way that people report their outcomes from modified barium swallows vary quite significantly even within single institutions. And so when we think about this from a research perspective, there's a real challenge in trying to compare outcomes of different sorts of treatments um, when we're all using different outcome measurements. Um, so that's uh, one of the reasons that I would argue for trying to come up with a core set of measures that we can all agree upon um, so that we're able to better compare patients across sites.
So there are three common tools that are used um, both clinically and in research that are um, excellent tools for uh, quantifying the modified barium swallow. The first is the penetration aspiration scale. Um, another is the modified barium swallow impairment profile, and then the dynamic imaging grade of swallowing toxicity. I'm going to talk about each of those um, individually. Uh, so the penetration aspiration scale, as I mentioned earlier, um, is this eight-point scale that allows a clinician to rate the airway infiltration of a patient during swallowing, um, how deep that material goes into the airway, and whether they feel it and are able to clear it. And this has been used widely for over two decades, um, and it uh, provides a, really a common nomenclature that clinicians and researchers can understand no matter where you're coming from. If it's a PAS of two or a PAS of four, we know what that means. Interestingly, though, recently there's been a lot of discussion about how the penetration aspiration scale has been used. So it was initially designed to provide uh, very granular data. So if a patient swallowed three times for a single, single bolus, they would have three different penetration aspiration scores, one for each instance of the swallow. And so that becomes a very onerous um, rating scale in terms of looking across, and it also doesn't provide sort of an overall gestalt. So you could end up with 30 or 40 penetration aspiration scale scores. So both clinically and research people have chosen to provide the worst score, uh, maybe the median score. Um, and so how the penetration aspiration scale has been used has been very different. And so it's important that when we're looking at the literature, that we're thinking about how exactly the scale was used in a particular study. The MBS impairment profile is a tool that was developed by a multidisciplinary group of swallowing specialists in order to provide a little bit more of a quantifiable measurement of physiologic function. And so it looks at parameters that happen in the oral phase of swallow, the pharyngeal phase of swallow, as well as the esophageal phase of swallow. And this is really important information because this helps clinicians to understand the underlying physiologic impairment um, so that the most um, appropriate treatment plan can be developed for a patient. Um, and so while this is very helpful from that perspective of understanding physiology, it doesn't necessarily give us a gestalt overall rating of safety or efficiency. So again, this may provide very, very helpful information clinically, but if we were looking to compare TORS versus radiation, again, as an example, um, this would be a little bit harder to use for that purpose. And so in response to these challenges in quantifying overall swallowing impairment in patients with head and neck cancer, particularly in the context of clinical trials, the digest scale was developed with this particular issue in mind. Uh, this was a collaboration between speech pathologists, surgeons, radiation oncologists, um, and the goal was really to develop a scale that would provide an overall severity rating of dysphagia um, similar to the CTCAE criteria that's used in clinical trials commonly. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with the CTCAE, the Common Terminology Criteria for Adverse Events, this is a five-point scale that is a clinician-rated scale to indicate severity of any treatment-associated toxicity. So we might use the CTCAE scale for um, hearing loss, for example. We might use it for dysphagia, for example. We might use it from a breathing perspective or airway perspective. Um, so basically, any outcome that could happen or any toxicity that can happen during a treatment has a CTCAE scale. Um, so Digest was developed because the original CTCAE grading scale for dysphagia is rather nonspecific. And so we can see here that patients um, have a grade one dysphagia if they are able to eat a regular diet. Um, but they're automatically up at a grade two if they have any altered eating or swallowing. And so most of our head and neck cancer patients at the very least are gonna be showing up as a grade two. Um, so that doesn't give us a lot of room here to sort of um, identify those more subtle impairments. Um, and, and again, many of our patients have pretty significantly altered eating and swallowing. So they would be up around a grade three. So 
if we really want to look again to compare radiation versus TORS or a particular chemo radiation from another chemo radiation, this really doesn't provide the granularity that we need to be able to make those comparisons. And so digest was developed with this particular issue in mind. Um, and the concept is that when we're thinking about overall pharyngeal swallowing impairment, we're really thinking about safety and we're thinking about efficiency. So can the patient get food down without it ending up in the airway? And are they able to get it down in a quick manner? Um, the adverse events of those not going well would be issues like pneumonia or malnutrition. And so digest was really developed in order to provide a similar CTCAE grading for dysphagia. And so uh, digest was developed uh, by a group of nine expert clinician researchers, um, each of which had a minimum of 10 years of clinical experience, both with video fluoroscopy and head neck cancer patients. Um, we did a initial content validation um, work together, and then uh, we had a modified Delphi exercise over three sessions of 10 hours to determine consensus on the digest scale and to operationalize this against the CTCAE benchmarks. And so the original digest publication in the journal Cancer reported on this scale where we use grades to assign a safety grade, an efficiency grade, and then an overall pharyngeal swallowing impairment score. The safety grade is gonna be based on the penetration aspiration scale, which I'll, I'll discuss with you in a moment how we did that. Um, the efficiency is going to look at the percentage of residue remaining in the pharynx after the initial swallow. And then it gets a little bit more specific in terms of um, whether that efficiency is different on different types of boluses, as well as how frequently penetration um, or aspiration events occur. And so this is the figure that demonstrates the first version of the safety grade decision tree for digest. So um, here we have the different penetration aspiration scale scores. And um, what the clinician or the researcher is going to be doing when they're using digest is rating each swallow. And so for each swallow, they're going to have a penetration aspiration scale score. Then what they're going to do is take the highest level penetration aspiration scale score, and that's where they're going to start in this decision tree. So if I have a patient who has silent penetration to the true vocal folds or flash aspiration, then my second question becomes, was it a single event of a trace amount less concerning than something that's intermittent or chronic? So intermittent meaning that it happened on multiple bolus trials, but less than 50% of a single viscosity, whereas chronic is the majority, more than 50% of trials or on multiple different viscosities. And so this takes into consideration, not just what the worst penetration aspiration scale score is, but how often it's happening and whether the degree of aspirate is gross or not gross. Uh, so again, it's trying to get that idea of severity and, and concern. Uh, there was a second degree or a second version of the digest safety scale that came out because a couple of things came up as people began implementing this both um, research and clinically. Uh, one of the issues was that if somebody had a single event of pe penetration aspiration scale score of three or four, we felt that that really didn't indicate significant impairment. This is something that we can see in normal individuals. So single event was changed to a grade zero. And then the other thing that was changed was that because we start at the highest level of the penetration aspiration scale, if somebody had a penetration aspiration score of seven and eight, but it only happened on one of it, one time and it was not gross, that would be a grade one. Even if they had multiple episodes of PS of five or six, which would give them a grade two. So this was changed to be basically what we call single plus, meaning if you had a single not gross aspiration event and multiple um, deep penetrations or flash aspirations, that's actually considered a grade two. From an efficiency perspective, we're looking at the percentage of residue remaining in the pharynx, and we're also looking at this according to different viscosities. So if we have a lot of uh, residue with liquid and pudding, that's going to 
be indicative of a more inefficient swallow than somebody who only has majority residue with solids. So taking into consideration the bolus type as well. And then taking that safety grade and that efficiency grade, we can use this decision tree to provide the overall severity score based on that interaction between safety and efficiency. And thinking about um, how the CTCAE criteria describes dysphagia, uh, we can think about a CTCAE score, an overall impairment score of one being that we see that something's not totally normal on our instrumental evaluation, but there's nothing that we need to do about it. We don't need to think about diet changes. We don't need to think about therapy. We just note that, okay, the epiglottis isn't tilting like it normally would. Um, a, a score of two would be indicative of of moderate, minimally non-invasive interventions. So that may be swallow therapy, that might be uh, diet alterations, that might be using something like a chin tuck. Um, so non-invasive um, interventions. Whereas a score of three would indicate something that's a little bit more significant, a little bit more medically significant. So that individual probably needs a feeding tube because they're not able to sustain nutrition. Um, versus a score of four, which would indicate that that patient needs to basically go have something done immediately that day. So that would be the very rare instance where I'm calling a surgeon up from the fluoro suite and saying, I think this person's going to need an urgent trach today uh, because they're uh, occluding their airway. So we don't see a lot of these fours, um, but we do see uh, many more in the, the three, three range with our patients. And so when we looked at um, the reliability of digest, so 100 modified barium swallows were uh, scored by two uh, skilled clinicians, and uh, both the inter and intra rater reliability were quite good, um, substantial for intra rater reliability and near perfect for intra rater reliability. And then looking at uh, validation um, in terms of uh, criterion validity, a number of different measures were used to uh, determine uh, the validity of the digest score. Strong correlations were found between digest and the MBS imp, which is that um, physiologic uh, measuring tool that I talked about earlier, um, as well as the oropharyngeal swallowing efficiency score. Uh, so the scores also were correlated with MD Anderson um, dysphagia inventory scores as well as diet scores. So this data demonstrates that this digest scale is a useful tool that can be used both clinically and in research and is particularly helpful in that clinical trial setting where we need to be comparing different treatments. And while modified barium swallows are uh, very commonly used in the head and neck cancer population, uh, we all also qu quite commonly use uh, flexible endoscopic evaluation of swallowing. Uh, and so FEES does not provide visualization of the oral or esophageal phases of swallowing. So there are differences in terms of the information that we get. But importantly, in the head and neck population, it does provide us that direct visualization of the pharynx and the larynx, and really allows us to see sort of structural implications on bolus flow from tumors or flaps. Um, so FEES is a really valuable tool, both clinically and from a research perspective. But again, we need to have good measures in order to be able to compare patients at different time points or across different treatments. And so uh, there are some tools that have been discussed in terms of fees. Um, the penetration aspiration scale, which we talked about for fluoroscopy, can also be used for fees. Um, other measures that are commonly used in this, um, for this exam would be some sort of a sec secretion severity rating. Um, and then there is also a scale called the Yale Pharyngeal Residue Severity Rating Scale, which rates the severity of pharyngeal residue at different points of the pharynx. Um, and then the VASES approach is something that is uh, very recently published, and I'll talk about a little bit more in a moment. Uh, so secretion severity is an important thing for us to take into consideration whenever we're performing endoscopy on patients because it has been shown that secretion severity scores, a number of them, uh, correlate quite significantly with aspiration. Um, so um, we can look at something like a three-point scale where um, uh, level one is indicative of basically normal or some penetration. Um, 
uh, level two being a little bit more moderate, where we're getting a little bit more towards uh, penetration versus a level three being more in terms of aspiration. The Yale pharyngeal residue rating scale provides ratings for accumulation of residue both in the vallecula as well as in the piriform sinuses. And they use anatomic landmarks in order to make this a little bit less um, or a little bit more objective, I should say. Um, so for instance, if we're looking at molecular residue, the epiglottic frenulum is used as a anatomic marker that we can differentiate between um, less, lesser degree of residue and greater degree of residue. Uh, the VASES method, which like I said, is just recently published and there is actually a very nice um, a webinar that was done on this last week for people who are interested. Um, but really, this was developed in order to provide a standardized way of rating penetration, aspiration, and residue during fees. Um, they talk about when to rate things, what to rate, where to rate, and how to rate. And so this sort of standardized method of rating was shown to improve the accuracy of rating uh, among raters, as well as reduce the amount of time required to rate um, fees exams. So during the development of Digest, I proposed to uh, Kate Hutchison, who is a, a speech pathologist and researcher at MD Anderson, that we consider adapting the scale for fees um, because we do use fees quite a bit in the head and neck cancer population. Uh, so we submitted a grant to the ASHA Foundation and we were able to bring in uh, really world experts in uh, fees. Um, so this is the team of people that came to Stanford um, to do our, um, our in-person validation meeting. And so we had eight clinician scientists with greater than 10 years of experience with fees and head neck cancer. Uh, we developed a prototype of the scale, which we uh, shared with our individuals um, and uh, had a survey completed. And then we did a modified Delphi method to establish consensus. Um, so we rated a total of 24 fees examinations. Uh, we had uh, anonymous online voting followed by discussion and then a second round of voting. And based upon that, we uh, developed our digest fees scale. Um, you will see that the safety grading scale for digest fees is basically exactly the same as the second second version of digest for fluoro uh, because the penetration aspiration scale really performs similarly across both of those um, tests. Um, where things got a little bit different was in terms of efficiency, because unlike fluoro, where you can um, sort of see how much of the bolus has entered the esophagus and then quantify how much is left behind, we aren't able to see into the esophagus with fees to, to get a sense of sort of what has passed through. And so there was a lot of discussion around how do we rate efficiency on, on fees. And um, Dr. Jessica Segna from uh, Boston has done a lot of work looking at how is it most reliable to, to measure efficiency. And so we used the markers that she's found in her research to be most um, reliable in terms of efficiency grading. Um, so uh, less than 10%, 10 to 33%, 34 to 66, or more than 66. So the percentages are slightly different than fluoro, but that really relates back to that, that factor that we cannot see in the esophagus. And so our estimates are a little bit different. And so we had uh, three expert raters who looked at a sample of 100 um, fees examinations, and we found that the inter-rater reliability was almost perfect for overall digest fees grade and safety and substantial for efficiency. And we found that our exact agreement for overall digest grade safety and efficiency was 62, 73, and 61%. And only 1% of the discordant ratings differed for more than one grade. Um, and our intra-rater reliability was almost perfect across the three rate raters. And so reliability of digest fees was found to be actually very similar to what we saw with digest fluoro. We used some different um, scales for validity purposes, but we did use both the MDADI and the FOI score. Um, but we also included in this the secretion severity score and the Yale score. And we found re uh, significant relationships between digest fees and all of our criterion measures. And uh, worse digest scores were correlated with worse patient reported outcomes, poorer diet scores, um, more secretion severity, and uh, higher levels of residue. So when we think about 
um, patients with head and neck cancer and dysphagia, um, there are other things that may be very meaningful in this population. So for example, tongue mobility and strength have been associated with a number of different swallowing outcomes. And so beyond just looking at the swallow itself, there are other things that we may want to think about, um, such as tongue mobility and strength. We may want to measure respiratory function and patient's ability to clear uh, material from the airway. And then there's a growing interest in laryngeal and pharyngeal edema and the relationship between this edema and dysphagia in patients with head and neck cancer. So this is a range of motion scale that was developed by Kathy Lazarus and her colleagues in New York um, that provides a quantifiable scale for range of motion in terms of protrusion, lateralization, and elevation. So this is something that can be very helpful for us in monitoring our patients over time, our partial glossectomy patients, for example, but also may be helpful in terms of monitoring for late radiation effects, such as neuropathy of hypoglossal nerve. Um, and it's quite simple to do and just relies on having the ability to uh, measure distances. Um, tongue strength is another uh, really important consideration for patients with head and neck cancer. Um, there have been a number of studies that have demonstrated that tongue strength and endurance are reduced in these patients. And so having a, a way to measure this is important. The Iowa Oral Performance Instrument is a great tool that we can use in the clinic that allows us to um, measure patients' tongue strength over time. And then finally, we can think about respiratory function. Um, we know that there is a great relationship between the respiratory system and uh, our ability to swallow safely. And a number of studies have been looking at specifically at cough strength in patients with head and neck cancer. Um, and so this is a study, uh, again, by Kate Hutchison and colleagues that looked at using um, a respiratory strength training in individuals who've had treatment for head and neck cancer. And so these individuals who had higher levels of aspiration also had poorer um, cough strength and expiratory force. And so that's another area that we may want to measure, particularly in our chronic dysphagia patients over time. And finally, I want to talk a little bit about internal edema. As I mentioned, there's really some emerging evidence that internal edema really does increase dysphagia risk, particularly in this population. And so this is a study out of Australia that looked at the severity of internal head and neck lymphedema and found that that was indeed associated with higher degrees of penetration and aspiration, more diet modification, and poorer patient-related outcomes. And they used uh, what's called the Patterson Edema Scale, which was initially published in 2007. And there were some issues with the original um, reliability. Some of the structures that were rated in the initial scale had relatively poor reliability. And so um, Dr. Patterson and I worked together with some of her colleagues in the UK to revise the Patterson Edema Scale. And some of you actually were part of our um, reliability rating. Uh, so the revised scale provided additional anatomic descriptions that were not present in the initial scale, um, and it also looked at a subset of sites that were more reliable on the initial scale. Um, we also provided images to sort of anchor those ratings for individual raters. And what we found is that these changes to the Patterson scale yielded a better reliability than the original scale. And this was performed by speech pathologists who are highly experienced, um, basically brand new endoscopy speech pathologists, otolaryngologists, as well as radiation oncologists. And our overall improvement increased from 0.54 to 0.64. And particularly, we saw improvement in terms of ratings of the epiglottis, the vollecula, and the pharyngoepiglottic folds. And so I'm going to just show you some of the images and the anchors that we use on the revised Patterson scale, because I do think this is a scale that probably has uh, potential um, applications for many of us um, in the department um, from pediatrics um, through different adult populations. Um, but we can see um, looking at um, the epiglottis, a normal rating, we see sort of well-defined crisp edges versus when we get into the mild rate, we still have a, you know, a pretty clear epiglottis, but it's a little bit thicker. 
versus much more thickened edges, but you can still tell it's an epiglottis versus this sort of amorphous, uh, flat, thick, um, with no definition. And then the vollecula looking at basically potential to hold residue as one of the main markers. So in a normal vollecula, we expect that individual to be able to hold residue fairly easily. Um, even though this vollecular space is smaller, still adequate for holding residue. Whereas as we get into moderate and severe, we can see there's really inadequate space for uh, bolus to reside in either the moderate or severe follicular edema. Springoepiglottic folds, again, we are providing sort of descriptors. So in the mild, we can still see definition in the band, but it's thick, but there's still enough space for things to pass around the epiglottis and through this sort of lateral channel. Um, whereas in a moderate case, we see definitely a lot less definition of the band. Um, there's really more sort of a thick bar versus a severe where there's really continuity between the epiglottis and the pharyngeal wall. Area epiglottic folds, again, we're looking at normal where we have a very well-defined band in contrast to this situation where maybe we just have unilateral edema of one a fold, whereas the other is fairly normal. As we get into moderate, we see less space between the arytenoids and the epiglottis. Um, there is a band, but it's shorter than what we see here uh, versus a severe case where there really isn't a, a visible band. In terms of the arytenoids, we're looking at um, the cuneiform cartilage as being one of the markers of edema here. Um, here we can see that it's quite bulky, maybe unilaterally swollen. And when we get down into the severe category, really we're seeing that there's no identifiable angle of the cuneiform cartilage. Um, piriform sinus, again, like we talked about with vollecula, we're really looking at sort of the depth of the piriform sinus space, um, as well as how well it can contain um, residue. So we can really see there's sort of obliteration of the piriform sinuses here in this severe um, example. And it's important to note that one of the things that we, we discuss in the publication of the revised Patterson scale is that you, you need to do specific tasks in order to be able to, to really look reliably at the different spaces. So you're going to be using phonation or sustained E in some cases. You're going to be doing um, cheek puffing and certain things. So, so we also provide sort of that, that structure in terms of how do you visualize these structures. Um, and then we rate the false vocal folds. Again, really important that we're not necessarily looking at this only during phonation because muscle tension, dysphonia, hypertrophy of the, the false vocal folds can look very similar to edema. So we wanna make sure that we're really rating the false vocal folds, um, not during phonation. And then finally, the true vocal folds, which really was the least reliable of these, um, really, I think, reflects back to the fact that in our head neck cancer patients, we don't tend to see high degrees of vocal fold edema. Those folks being radiated, the radiation oncologists are working very hard to block the larynx. And so we don't tend to see a lot of variability in terms of edema. And in fact, as you guys can all uh, appreciate, this Renke's edema picture is not necessarily something that came from a head neck patient. We just don't tend to see a lot of this uh, severe edema in the larynx. And so to wrap up, um, I hope that I have impressed upon you the importance of a multidimensional assessment in patients with head and neck cancer. It's critical that we take into consideration the patient perception of their dysphagia. Uh, but we also need to think about sort of the implications. We need to think about what the diet implications are. We need to think about health status. And we definitely need to think about neuromotor motor function. Um, there's been a lot of recent research that's really focusing on improving the validated measures of dysphagia. If we look back at historical data, the reliability was actually quite poor for a lot of these because we didn't have standard measures. Um, so this is a really um, emerging area of research. Um, and we really need to think again about what is the intent of the evaluation um, and choose those outcome measures appropriately and, and develop core sets of measures that we might find to be beneficial.
Um, certainly, we're, we're still uh, early on in terms of research. I think there's a lot that needs to be done in this space, um, particularly, as I mentioned, in terms of establishing a core set of agreed upon dysphagia measures, particularly for patients in the head neck population. So with that, I will be happy to answer any questions that anyone has. Hey, Heather, it's Kwong. How are you? Good, how about you? Great, great. Thanks for the talk. It's uh, really uh, good to hear about uh, some of the ways that we're thinking about, uh, about dysphagia in this population. You know, the, when, I think one of the major difficulties is though it's such, such a heterogeneous population, right? And um, it really varies depending on whether they've had surgery, the, the primary tumor site, uh, radiation versus chemo radiation. And, and you really, you, we kind of very much lump everybody together uh, when we're kind of thinking, you know, when we think about, oh, this person just has dysphagia. And um, it, it then becomes really hard to kind of tease out, you know, what really matters in terms of, and, and you know, there's a lot of different things to think about, right? As you were saying, like we tend to think about as clinicians, a lot of the times it's the penetration aspiration because we're worried about patients getting pneumonia, but that might not be the, 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 the biggest concern for these people. You know, it's the, their quality of life of how much they can take in by mouth and, and, and uh, how, you know, what they, they're able to enjoy, right? So it's a, it's a really tough problem. Um, and then, you know, from a surgeon perspective, so much of it is like, well, what can we do about it, right? Sure. And how, how can we utilize some of these evaluations to figure out like what, can, what is something that we can actually do about it surgically uh, to, to help fix this problem? So I, I guess I'm just spouting off a lot of different things that, that really, you know, don't lead to a whole lot, but um, you know, it's, this is just these are just very tough questions. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I think it's it is a a very complex population that is you know is not a population. It's a it's a lot of different issues that we're dealing with, and it, you know, it can be everything from weakness to fibrosis to stricture to you know. I mean, we can just go on and on and on. Um, and I and I do think that's where this sort of multi-dimensional assessment is so critical. Uh, because if we only look at patient reported outcome measures, we may be missing out the patient who is aspirating and ending up with pneumonia. Uh, but if all we do is think about physiology, then we're not paying attention to sort of the patient perspective. So I agree, it's very challenging. And I think we have a lot of work to do in terms of trying to find ways to define which patients are gonna be the best surgical candidates. So, you know, a lot of our patients who have reduced UES opening, it, it may be propulsive. It may be that they, they don't have adequate propulsion through the pharynx, either because of fibrosis or because of weakness, but it also may be hypertrophy of the cricopharyngeus. And if we just dilate everybody and we don't address the propulsive part, then we're missing part of the, part of the issue. But we don't really have great ways to predict what patients are going to do best with which treatments. And so I do think that getting these sort of core sets of measures where we can start really asking these questions is really important. Right. And uh, propulsion is such, such a tough thing for us to fix too, right? That's yes. like the, the, you know, we can fix, we can help stricture, uh, whether it's by dilation or by CP myotomy, but propulsion is really a tough one for us to do anything about. And I have Absolutely. a question about, um, you know, are we measuring flow, you know, in some, some you know, um, quantitative way, uh, you know, whether, I, I mean, I just don't know like what tools you guys are using and are, are available. Like maybe, you know, a couple of years ago, there, there was some talk about using um, real-time MRI, right? Or um, right. Dynamic MRI to try to assess some of these things, and also for the propulsion side, you know, are we using manometry, pharyngeal manometry, well enough um, to to be able to use that to predictively? Absolutely, great question. So I'll I'll tackle the manometry one. So um, 
there there is emerging work looking at fragile manometry. Um, and I know one of the groups that's done a lot of work in this space is down um, in Sydney, um, Julia McLean and Ian Cook's lab. And um, the last time that I had a conversation with her, they've been very disappointed that the pharyngeal manometry is not providing great predictive information about who benefits from dilation or doesn't benefit. So I think that's probably going to be our best tool because it does measure pressure and pressure at different points, which is really what we need to do when we're trying to figure out whether we're talking about propulsive or restrictive disorders. Um, but we just don't have a great way to do that yet. So I think it's one of those things that a lot of people are very interested in and, and certainly hopefully we'll see more of that. Well, Heather, I wanted to compliment you on a great Grand Rounds and really um, you're very humble about presenting your role. Um, I, I'd like to just brag a little bit to the whole department about how essential you were to really develop digest and 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 to refine digest uh, over the last years even despite a pandemic so kudos and hands off and whatever we do in the virtual world to acknowledge your your, your great contributions um and Kwong, just to follow on your question i mean having this kind of data this really granular objective data is really helpful for us in this small little finite world of you know tours versus radiation and so it sort of begins there and maybe that'll trickle out into laryngeal cancers that, that that you'll deal with as well so that we'll actually use this not to kind of like clean up after radiation and chemo radiation um and say oh well, what are we going to do but actually to help make a better decision early on to say oh wow this person is already devastated and radiation will make it worse so um ha having said that i just wanted to ask heather really briefly how do you think this is going to be taken up by the broader uh, SLP community? Is this something people are going to embrace? Or are going to be like, oh man, what? How do I implement this? Is, you know, t talk a lot, a little bit about that, um, and then I'll stop there. There's one other question, but there are probably others that I have. Sure. Yeah. No. It's actually uh, a lot of traction has been um, with both digest and digest fees. There's a lot of interest. Um, uh, Dr. Hutchinson and I are going to be doing a master course at our ASHA convention this year and invited master course because there's so much interest in people want to know how do I implement this, how do I use it so yeah it's actually really exciting. Um, because it also provides a scale that's pretty similar, regardless of what exam so if we have patients who have had a fees or a modified we can use that digest score to really um, quantify the severity of their dysphagia um, either way so it's pretty exciting. You're going to be busy once we travel again. Mm -hmm. Here. Hey, Heather. Hey there. Hey, we're, we're in the OR and we were listening to you while operating. And we, we were wondering whether radioactive iodine has any uh, objective lymphedema associated with it, you know, compared to extra renal that's a great question. Um, I don't. I don't know that there's any data specifically on that. Um, theoretically, it makes a lot of sense that there could be, um, but I have not seen any data on radioactive iodine and lymphedema. Um, and you know, we'll <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll add it to the list of things that I do for my <laughs> doctoral work. Um, but part of that too is, and you know, just to, you know, as a teaser for things to come, we don't have a, a great core outcome set for lymphedema either for head and neck. Um, so that's something that I am working very actively on right now. Um, but yeah, I think that's a really great question. Along with all the other dysphagia related things that happen with thyroid cancer. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks. Hey, Heather, it's Beth Beadle. Thank you so much for inviting us to come to this and for your great talk. So if you had your magic wand and wanted to insert um, functional outcomes into ongoing or future clinical trials, you know, I think a lot of a, a lot of them now kind of check the box with the M daddy with a thought that a 10 point difference is sufficient to prove a benefit or lack thereof, but really has nothing else. What do you think would be most meaningful and value added either in addition to that instead of that or in coordination? Yeah, I think that's a really, a really great question. And I think, you know, we've graduated, right? So like 10, 15 years ago, the only thing anybody talked about was feeding tube dependence. So, so, you know, now at least with the M daddy, we're getting that patient perception, but it, again, it's not enough because it only tells part of the story. So I would say that we want to have that patient perception. Certainly the M daddy is a fantastic tool for that. 
we probably want to be doing a digest score, whether it's a, a fees or a modified barium swallow, because we really want to understand that underlying um, impairment of, of swallowing function. And then we probably do want to take those sort of surrogate measures in terms of um, diets. So I think those three things are going to be the core piece that should be part of any trial that's looking at functional outcomes. Thanks. Definitely something to keep in mind, even as we do investigator initiated trials here, both surgically and radiation based, um, and then take them outside of the location. So it's great to have that insight and input for, um, for how to move it forward. Absolutely. And the final thing, Heather, um, you have so many great videos, and I know we've talked about this before. Um, what are the steps you might want to start to take now to use um, deep learning and computer vision to take digest to really to that next even more granular level? Yeah, I think it's it's definitely something that's going to be really interesting to explore. Um, I think that it will be, if I think about digest versus the Patterson scale. I think the Patterson scale is going to be a whole lot easier to do that um, versus digest because digest is really going to be looking at so many different events over time. Um, but I think absolutely this is something that um, we are really ripe to explore at Stanford. And I'm, I'm really excited to, to uh, meet with some of the folks who, who do some of the AI work and um, see what we can, can figure out in terms of trying to make this something that can be standard. I came in, I'm like, finishing up a Zoom meeting, I was like sitting here, I was like, hmm, I've been here for five minutes and that thing is, is still uh Hey Kwong, I think oh, you're not on mute. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, yeah. are, you, are you done? I so, um, so I, I think the final thing, I just want to compliment Heather uh, and congratulate her. You, you probably won't be surprised to know with all of this, uh, all these many contributions that uh, Professor Starmer's uh, soon to be completing her PhD uh, on some, on one of these many exciting projects. So. Uh, thanks for that and good luck with everything, Heather, as, as, uh, as, as your studies continue. Thank you. All right. I think right. it's, we, we get five minutes of our day back. Thank you, Heather, for How that. How about too. that? Yeah. Great. Thank you all for coming and uh, for your very interesting questions. Good night. Bye. Take Bye. care.